Well, thank you, Ingrid, for that kind introduction. Uh, normally, uh, when you'd give a talk on an intellectual topic, you talk about, first of all, the what, and then the how, and then the why. I'm going to do it the other way around today. I'm going to talk about the, the how I became a health and medical researcher, then perhaps why I became one and why I hope you might become one, and finally, how you should be a medical researcher, because I think these are, that's the right order to do things. So the, uh, how I became a medical researcher and is actually more to do with f fortuitous circumstance than perhaps any specific intent. When I was a young uh, schoolboy, I actually wanted to be an astrophysicist. I was really interested in uh, what was at that time a very exciting era in astrophysics because the technologies had been opened up that allowed us to understand a lot more about the universe than we had previously done and every time you read in the newspapers about it, it was seen very exciting. Uh, so I obviously didn't pursue that line and that was partly, uh, again, a chance event. I uh, ended up studying German at high school and that was bec not because I wanted to study German at high school but because I had a row with my parents. My parents were really keen that I should study history. I wanted to study music uh, uh, as a choice of subjects at school. Uh, they won out, but to annoy them, I then dropped French and decided I would study German. Uh, and how did that lead me to become a research scientist? Well, it's a, th it's, a, it's a complex story, but the first part of it was that because I was studying German at high school in Scotland, I was encouraged to go and get a summer job in Germany. So I went and took a summer job at the Porsche car factory in, Su in Sufenhausen, in, near Stuttgart. My job was to test the correct pre preparation of the wheel bolts that held the wheels onto the car. So if you've got a 1971 Porsche, I would be very careful about how you drive it around corners, because I don't guarantee that the wheel bolts will hold the wheels on. Uh, but at any rate, my, I stayed with my German pen friend and he had, a daughter, he had a girlfriend across the other side of town. Now, his parents wouldn't let him go and see his girlfriend unless I went along with him. Uh, I don't know, I was supposed to be a chaperone for the mail. It was a little unusual. But at any rate, uh, I would go there. But of course, I was as wanted <laughs> in that particular engagement, as you might imagine. So I was kicked out once we got to see the girlfriend. And since I didn't know anybody else, I actually went and talked with the, girl, the girlfriend's father. Now, he was a uh, clinician scientist, Professor Gunther from uh, Tübingen University, and I was still thinking astrophysics, and he was saying, yeah, look, astrophysics, fine, but there's no jobs there. I think you should go into medicine. So I did. Uh, and I, <laughs> well, as you do, I came back uh, uh, to Scotland, and instead of studying physics at Edinburgh University, I studied medicine. Uh, and then, because I studied medicine, and because I was interested in science, I wanted to do a little bit of research, and I started doing research as a pathologist in the pathology department there, and realized that all the good immunology which I was studying was being done at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. So that I decided that uh, I had better come out to Melbourne when I got the opportunity and to see if I could get a, some sort of job here. And as an undergraduate student, I came out and visited, and then I went back to Scotland again. Uh, one big advantage, by the way, of changing to medicine rather than physics was that I actually met my wife that way. Uh, the f physics crowd were very nerdy and they didn't go into that sort of thing very much. The, the, the medical crowd were a much better social crowd and you got a, lot, got a better opportunity to uh, uh, meet people, shall we say. Anyway, I came out uh, as an undergraduate student to uh, Melbourne, worked at the Walter and Lysol Institute for a short while, went back to Scotland and realised that if I was going to make a career in medical research, then it would probably be quite important that I went to the best place in the world. So that's a, a message I hope that you understand. You would really want to be in the best place in the world if you're going to get a training. So I decided I would come back to Australia, had to then apply to emigrate here. And they asked me if I had a criminal record, and I said I didn't realise you still had to have one to come here. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, they let me in nonetheless. Uh, and I worked in uh, Ian Mackay's lab at the Walter Eliza Hall Institute. 
At that time, he was studying liver disease, and I ended up studying liver disease as well. Uh, so he suggested that I should go off to Europe to meet with the experts in the field, because that was traditional in those days. It, you went to Europe if you could from Australia. And uh, because I spoke German, because I'd learned German at school, I decided I should go to Germany, because I could at least converse with the scientists there. And he wanted me to go and see a guy called Hans Meyer from Buschenfelde, who was uh, the, the expert in liver disease at that time. And so I went to see Hans Meyerson Buschenfelder at the German Cancer Research Institute. And Hans Meyerson Buschenfelder uh, was uh, a, a very senior German, very proper German. And he took me to introduce me to his boss. And his boss happened to be Harold Zerhausen, who at that time ran the German Cancer Research Institute. And Harold said, look, you don't want to study liver disease. <laughs> liver disease is boring. I'm interested in viruses that cause cancer. And why don't you get interested in that area? So I thought, OK, uh, when I went back to Australia, I was getting a bit fed up with working with liver anyway. I don't know if working with liver is sort of messy stuff, and you don't like eating it, well, you don't like working with it either. So I decided I would change to work on papillomavirus. Uh, and uh, that, of course, has led to some very interesting research for me. It also uh, then meant that I had to learn from people who worked on papillomavirus. So I made another trip across to Europe, this time to uh, Cambridge University, where I met Margaret Stanley, who was at that time the person that was working most on papillomavirus. And there I had the good fortune to meet up with my erstwhile colleague, Dr. Jan Zhu. Now, Jan and I had two things in common. One, we were both absolutely fascinated with the idea of papillomaviruses and cancer. But much more importantly, neither of us spoke English. He spoke Chinese and I spoke Scottish. And so in the lab, we were the only two people that were sort of ostracized. And we sat in a corner and talked with each other about papillomaviruses. And that led, of course, to me getting Jan to come out here and in due course to the development of the uh, vaccine that we now recognize that protects us against cervical cancer. So that was my journey to here and to where I got to. And as you can see, it wasn't exactly preordained that I would end up there. But if I had stayed studying French, I probably would have stayed studying physics, and therefore I would have probably ended up as a broke astrophysicist working somewhere in France rather than a, a comfortably off uh, clinician scientist working in Australia. So that's how I got there. Now, thinking a little bit about why we do it, if this thing works. No, probably not. Does it need to be switched on? Uh -huh. Oh, well, that's the first lesson that you learn as a scientist. <laughs> Get somebody who knows what they're doing to work the equipment for you. OK. Well, why would you want to become a medical researcher? Well, hopefully, it's because you're driven by curiosity, because good science starts with a question that you really want to get an answer to. And if you're interested in health and disease, and I gather most of you are medical students, then you should be really interested not only in the delivery of the service, which is very important, but also in the problems that you're trying to solve. And your curiosity starts early. This is me in Scotland, and uh, when I was about three years old, taking my tricycle to bits. Uh, if you have the urge to curiosity, build on it, because that will be what will drive you in the direction you want to go. A second and equally important reason is because you want to make sure if you're uh, doing things to patients, and you will do things to patients, that you get it right. And a tradition is not a great basis for getting correct treatments. We have, uh, you, I mean, we would still be using leeches if we did things traditionally. Uh, well, actually, we do use leeches still, by the way, but just for a very limited scope of work. So the reason that we can get it right is because we do research. And that really means that every single person who is working in health and medic medical service delivery should be doing research at least at the level that they understand what the research is about, what the research methods are, and how you can apply them. Because if you don't have that, you can't actually contribute to the discipline that you're working in. I started in medical research at a very early age. Uh, 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 one of those three individuals up there is me, and I can tell you that I haven't changed my sex or my skin color, so you should be able to work out which one it is. Um, but when I was an undergraduate, my job was to put the infusion lines into patients that were going for surgery. And since my job was then to replace them when they clotted up, I used to get really fed up of being called in the middle of the night to replace a line in somebody's arm after they'd had surgery. And I really wondered if there was a way of reducing the risk of that happening. 
So we did a little project looking at the different means by which you could put intravenous lines into patients. <coughs> and because it was an interesting little project, we thought we should write it up, and it got published in the British Medical Journal, which was my first research paper. So it, you're never too young to start doing the research. If you're curious, if there's a question that needs an answer, just get out there and answer it. So at the end of the day, you do the whole thing because we're all in the same game of trying to look after society better through the medical care that we provide. And I think that I've had the good fortune to choose a significant problem to deal with because I was really interested in viruses that cause cancer as a result of my interaction with Harold Surhausen, who described how papillomavirus was responsible for cervical cancer. And so it's good to choose a significant problem. Ingrowing toenails does not fascinate the community nearly so much as cancer. And you should pick an area where you think you can make a difference because you think it's important. Of course, it does help if you become part of the solution to the problem. And I, I've been very fortunate to be part of this solution because Harold Zerhausen's work enabled the work on cervical cancer, and Jan Zhu and I came up with the technology which eventually led to the vaccines. And I should acknowledge uh, Andrew Cuthbertson and CSL because they were a key part of this process of getting from the technology that we developed in 1990 to the vaccine. So they are now out there in 2000, since 2005. But the important thing is choose a problem that really excites you that's worthwhile answering. Do not choose a career in medical research because you want a secure career. You have to get used to a funding model which is not likely to change in my lifetime unless you can come up with a solution better than the ones that we've come up with. You have to get used to three to five year funding. But one of the advantages of being a researcher in health and medical research is that you have a fallback position that you can just go on being a professional in your area and helping other people to do research. And I think it's important to remember that. But I have to say that amongst all the people that I've mentored over 40 years now, every single one of them who wanted to get there has. You know, if you're determined, you will contribute to the field. And don't do it for money or fame, although quite a few of my students have maintained that that was the reason they went into it. You may get there, you may be lucky, like I was, uh, and get both the fame and, well, at least a gold medal, if not the money. But it's not a good reason for doing it on its, of itself, because most of you, if you do health and medical research, will be putting one piece of the jigsaw puzzle in, and that's the satisfaction you get. You may not be putting the last piece in, but you will be putting a piece into the puzzle. And without all the pieces, you don't have a solution to the puzzle. And if you're lucky enough to put the last piece in, or a key piece, or maybe an edge or a corner somewhere, then you may get a little more acknowledgement. But you'll always have the satisfaction you've learned and done something useful. OK, so I've sold the idea. Now, how are you going to go about doing it? OK, well, you have to be ready for the rough and the smooth. This is me again in Scotland, the one sunny day in Glasgow that we could get a photograph. Note, <laughs> impoverished scientist, no money, tin bath. But at least a smile on the face. Don't expect it will stay that way all the time. <laughs> times get rough and you will have to accept that there will be bad times as well as good. 98% of your science will not work the way that you think it will. And you just have to acknowledge that's the, th that's the way it goes. You have to define success in different ways. In other words, success is not necessarily getting it right all the time. Success is knowing you've contributed usefully to the field. You might become, you get a university named after you, the University of Ian, well, not really, but that's what they said. Or you might get a title like that put up about you, uh, which uh, <laughs> um, I, th I think it was actually the vaccine they were talking about there, but never mind. Um, and it may not always turn out as you expect, because that was what Cosmopolitan magazine had to say about me. <laughs> Uh, oh, well, you take the rough with the smooth, uh, but you would aim to be the one that puts the last piece in the puzzle, because you probably will just have to be content with putting a piece in. Okay, so how are you going to go about making sure that you get to the right place? Just make sure I'm not using all my time up. Uh, so first thing is, you really want to choose a mentor or two that you would aspire to be like, uh, and then you have to choose a problem. And I was fortunate, and I had a number of mentors. I had a very good clinician uh, when I was an undergraduate student called John Monroe, who I don't have a photograph of, unfortunately, who taught me how to be a good clinician. And 
he inspired me to do research as an undergraduate and uh, the, as his resident and eventually as his registrar. Uh, he had a very clear vision that you treat the treatable. This was his philosophy in medicine. You don't worry about things you can't do, but if you can do research to try and solve the problem, you should do it. And then I came to Australia, and this is a very young Ian Mackay, uh, who was my mentor in Australia. And he taught me that you should focus on the patient all the time, because that's really what drives the agenda. And then this guy, Gus Nossel, who's known to you, I'm sure, taught me another very important thing about science, and that is communication is a great part of it. You have to be prepared to go and sell what you're doing. You start by selling it to get the money to do it, by selling it to get somebody to supervise you to do it. Eventually, you end up having to convince the community that what you're doing is a good idea and government that it's a good idea. So that being able to project your vision for what you're wanting to do to the world at large is really important. And if you're choosing a problem, well, genital warts, which is where I started, probably isn't the most exciting thing, but it was better than liver disease. Uh, I, look, I, I started with, I've worked my way through every sexually transmitted infection you can think of, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, AIDS, papillomavirus, uh, now herpes. So uh, there are plenty of problems out there to solve. Uh, but just remember, you might have to talk about it over dinner with your partner, so if, <laughs> you might want to choose something that's not too difficult to discuss in public. Um, uh, second step, you've decided on your mentors, you've decided what you want to study, you have to become the expert in what's been done in the past in your area. It's not so difficult these days because you have at your disposal all sorts of electronic tools that were simply not available when I was a medical student. When I had to go to the library to learn about something, there was a thing called Index Medicus, which occupied about half of all the library space. And it went back to 1843, it was volume one. And if you wanted to find all the papers in a particular area, you literally waded through all the volumes, looking under whatever indexing term you could think of to find out. But you do need to know the area as best you can. Uh, this guy, Rigoni Stern, was the one who did the epidemiology of cervical cancer, and I'll come back to that in a little moment. But uh, the history of papillomavirus and cervical cancer started with a guy whose job was to try and prevent cervical cancer, and he came up with the idea of screening for it, the very first screening test for a disease. And he invented the PAP test, which at that time was screening not for preventing cervical cancer, but actually catching it early so it could be treated. And then, of course, Harold Zerhausen drew the link between the virus and the cancer. Uh, the guy, Rigoni Stern, was really quite interesting. He was a mathematician, and there's another lesson in that, and that is that you should be quite prepared to cross disciplines to get answers to your solutions. He was interested in uh, who got cancer, because remember, in 1840, when this was being looked at, the understanding of cancer as a disease had really just crystallised out. No, the concept that cancer was a growth, something went wrong with tissue, that became possible because, of the, because people developed histological techniques, which I'd remind you grew out of the dye industry in Germany. It was the people who dyed cloths that came up with the stains that enabled us to look at sections of tissue and work out that there was actually something wrong with cells in there. So that the, uh, Rigoni Stern was a mathematician and he was aware of the fact that the cancers that were common in those days, and remember in 1840, the average life expectancy was 40 years. So in Italy in 1840, there were only two cancers to worry about. They were both cancers of women. One was breast cancer and the other was cervical cancer. They were the two cancers that occurred in people under the age of 40. And he made a correct observation that nuns were much more likely than what he called other women uh, to get uh, uh, some cancers, and particularly cancer of the uterus was commoner in the other woman, and cancer of the breast was commoner in nuns. Uh, uh, just to put that in perspective, in 1840 in Italy, about one in five women was a nun. If you couldn't marry off your daughters, you sent them to the nunnery, because that was the only way that they would get a living. So that there was a fairly large number of nuns to survey. And so he, made, he drew this conclusion, which is a correct observation. And then he put up a hypothesis. And now this is where you've got to be careful not to cross disciplines, because mathematicians should not hypothesize easily about the cause of disease. So he thought 
you, you, you uterine cancer was not increased through the licentious practices of women, but rather it was greatest amongst women who were ex excessively sensitive, sensitive, morally, and nervously irritable. <laughs> um, uh, not quite sure what the definition of those terms would be when you were doing the, the epidemiological survey. Uh, he didn't do much better with the breast cancer. He thought that breast cancer might be due to the fact that their, the nuns' habits were too tight and they crossed their hands across their chest and that that would compress the breasts and cause breast cancer. Uh, so dangerous thing, putting up hypotheses. You might quite have to test them. Interesting thing, that's a testable hypothesis, that one. The previous one is not. I do not know that you could make a control group of nervously irritable women to test a hypothesis. But this one you could if you really wanted to. You could go out there and test it. And that's important to remember. If you have a hypothesis, you have to have a test that you can apply to see if your hypothesis is correct. In other words, research is based on observation with the idea that it's falsifiable. In other words, it must either be true or not true, and you must be able to tell. Anyway. Having got through the process of working out what area you're going to work on, picking a problem, getting, getting some sort of idea about what the history of the problem is, you then have to get a good technical training. First of all, a training in research methodology. And that starts right now. You know, there is ne you're never too soon to start doing that. Expose yourself to the science. Go to the talks in the hospital. Go read the journals. Read the newspapers. Find out what's going on there. And then hopefully, if you get on with your research, you'll be writing plenty and publishing papers, and that will give you the chance to interact with other people who are doing the same sort of thing, who will want to know what you're doing. Very important, learn ethical scientific behavior. There are many dimensions of ethics, and I'm not going to talk about them all today, but it really is important to understand that this is a discipline where you are, you are the policeman of your own work. You are responsible for making sure that the science you do is acceptable to the community, is actually correct, and to the best of your ability, done in a way that will allow other people to draw conclusions from it. And that's what ethical scientific behavior is about. You will learn that from your supervisor. You will learn it from the other people round about you. But it's ultimately you that determines whether you get that right. And if things aren't working out, if you've gotten to the wrong place with the wrong supervisor, change. Don't wait and see what will happen. I see so many careers wasted because people decide that they should stay loyally with somebody and it's not the right thing for them to do. So be prepared to change if you have to. You've got to work out what your career is going to look like and you should, now is a good time to start planning it. And work out what you'll have to do for the progression from one stage of it to the next. That's one of the things the Academy of, of Health and Medical Sciences is trying to do for clinician scientists. But whatever area of research you end up in, it's really important. You'll do good work because that will be the driver. You'll first of all have to demonstrate you can do it independently because that will be the proof that you can really look after yourself in science. But then you will have to do it working with others because research is a team business and you really have to show that you can work in teams and deliver more effectively by doing that. Eventually you will start supervising others who are doing science and you'll have to then work out the balance of how you look after their career and their science versus your career and your science. You're going to have to spend a lot of time learning how to con people into giving you money. Uh, there are many ways of doing that. Uh, the legal ones are preferable. Uh, I wouldn't go for the other ones. But learning to write grants is important. Learning to collaborate is important. And also participating in the whole process of looking after your colleagues through peer review. Because the whole system will either be run by us, for us, or it will be run by someone else for us. And by and large, if it's a choice between us and someone else, I would go with us any time. So it's important not to let it get out of our control. And eventually, you'll have to decide what you're good at. That might be a technology. It might be an area of interest. It might just be that you're the best science writer there ever was. You know, you're going to have to pick an area and be in the hopes that you will then make a career out of it. I was very lucky to meet this guy. Partners are really important in science. This is Jan Zhu in Westlake in uh, China. He was kind enough to take me around his hometown, home university there. And his wife was a major driver behind this. I mean, well, he was talking about things. She did all the work. And that's absolutely true. All the science that came out of the, that collaboration was done by Jan and Xiaoyi. Uh, but you will 
have, you will build teams and work with people. This is my team from about 10 years ago. I recognize a few faces in there still. Uh, I'm, over my lifetime, I now have a contact of about 120 people that I have mentored through a science career. And they are great because I can go and visit them anywhere in the world anytime and they're always pleased to see me. At least I think they are. They always say they are. Uh, uh, so aim for your group to be the world leader in its field uh, because there's no point in being in science unless you're doing world leading science. Uh, that sounds very hard, but me too science doesn't help anybody. It's the bre groundbreaking stuff that makes a difference. And you've got to learn this business of giving to your next generation and look after them. And you've got to learn to promote science in the community. But the other side of things, by the way, is you've got to make sure you have a life outside of your health and medical research work because it is a very challenging business and you will get I'm sure mentally exhausted from time to time and so make sure you've got something else to do. This is me with my son skiing in the States and that's uh, interestingly all three of my kids said they were not going to be a, a medical scientist like their dad. Uh, one studied law, one studied engineering, one studied veterinary medicine. All three of them are now doctors and all three of them are, well two of the three of them are doing medical research. So it just goes to show that you can still act as a role model, even if they didn't like the role model very much when they first saw it. Uh, uh, so I'm, we'll probably uh, start to wind this up a little bit and let you ask some questions. But I'll just set you a couple of challenges, because this is what it's all about for the future. When this, these cartoons were drawn on a temple wall in Komombo in Egypt some 5,000 years ago, this is a birthing stool, and these rather interesting looking instruments that look like they're for building the temple are actually means of getting bladder stones out of the bladder, because schistosomiasis was a dominant infection in Egypt, and bladder stones from schistosomiasis were extremely common, and these things were help, helped you to hook the stones out. Anyway, when, that, when these cartoons were drawn on the temple there, the average life expectancy in Egypt was 40 years. The average life expectancy in sub-Saharan Africa is still 40 years. We haven't managed to improve it over 5,000 years of practice. But on a global basis, it stayed at 40 years until the 1840s. You know, all of the nostrums and things that we did for people up until the 1840s made no difference to life expectancy on the planet at all. <coughs> What made a difference were two revolutions, and it wasn't the American and the French one, although they both occurred just about that time. It was the agricultural revolution which gave us plenty food, and the industrial revolution which gave us safe water for the first time. And the reason that Africa still has a life expectancy of 40 years of sub-Saharan Africa is because they still do not have access to safe water and enough food. What's happened, of course, since then is vaccines and antibiotics in the 20th century which have added 15 years by getting rid of most of the childhood infections that used to wipe out large numbers of people and bring the average age of death down considerably. Of course, some of this is going to be lost in the 21st century. Your generation are going to have the challenge of the post-antibiotic era to deal with. And I think it will be quite an interesting one, if that's the right word for it. And the, all the rest of research has only added a very few years up at the top there to life expectancy. But, of course, that's to miss the point, really, isn't it? Because the, the research, medical research that we do nowadays is not so much about prolonging life, but increasing the quality of life and dealing with the chronic diseases of ageing, which I will no doubt get in due course, and which I hope you will have solved before I get them. Because that's really where the challenges are. And this is the last one that I'll leave you with. And we can't ignore it. And that is that since 1960, GDP has grown in Australia at about 6% per annum. Expe expenditure on healthcare has grown at about 9% per annum and is still growing far at that rate. And this is a global phenomenon. We are spending more and more of the wealth that we produce on healthcare. And that is not a sustainable exercise. So that research is a fundamental part of the solution to this problem. The research can do two things. It can make us use our money more effectively by getting rid of a bit. This is a, one of these awful graphs that economists put up. But uh, basically, this is looking to see what the benefit you get from dollars spent is up this way and the actual dollars that you spend. And so vaccines and public information systems come cheap and give good health outcomes. At the other end of the spectrum, adverse drug reactions and preventable surgical complications actually make us worse but cost more money. 
So that basically, this is a diagram from the McKeon Committee report, which if you have time, you should, well, I don't know, don't, don't read the report. It's a very thick volume. Don't even read the summary of the report, but you could might perhaps read the summary of the summary, which is only two pages long, and it tells you what we thought should be done in health and medical research. Uh, the point is that although that's important, we actually don't live in an economy. We live in a society. And remembering that medical research is about improving the wealth of society. It's, the wealth is not so much fi financial wealth as social capital. That's what we get out of medical research. But you can't forget that graph where we're spending more and more on healthcare because governments never will. They have to live with that. So those are the challenges that you face when you go into medical research. You've got to solve the practical problem that we're spending more and more on healthcare at the same time as you make us live longer and healthier. And that will be your challenge for the 21st century. And I'll stop at that point. Thank you very much for your attention.